Buena Aventura. Okay, so we're gonna start. Um, first of all, welcome to everybody, to the students and administratives, and also Mr. Tanreiro Machado, welcome to this uh, conference. This is an international conference titled Some Computational Methods of Information Analysis and Clustering. Uh, Mr. Tenredo Machado is graduated with PhD in 1989 and habilitation in 1995 in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Porto. He currently he is the principal coordinator professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering, Institute of Engineering, the Polytech, uh, Polytechnic of Porto in Portugal. He published 116 chapters of books. 512 papers in journals, 368 papers in conferences, four books in Portuguese, and seven books in English. Okay, and more are coming. He is the editor of 19 books, editor, editor in chief of Handbook of Fractional Calculus with application in A balls, a guest editor of 54 special issues in journals. Editor in chief in Journal of Vibration Testing and System Dynamics Mathematics, the section editor in chief of Entropy, uh, also associate editor of Nonlinear Dynamics International Journal of Bifurcation and Chaos, uh, the Fractional Calculus and Applied Analysis, also the Journal of Vibration and Control and the International Journal of Nonlinear Sciences and Numerical Simulation, Applied Mathematical Modeling, Computational and Applied Mathematics, uh, Acta Politecnica, Hungarica, and others. Uh, talking about Google Scholar, the age index 74, the number of citations are 28,191, in Scopus, age index 57, the number of citations is 15,025. In the Web of Science, private analytics, the age index 52, the number of citations uh, scored 12,466. Is highly cited researcher, cross field in 2019 and in 2020, and the top reviewer in mathematics in 2019. Is the top reviewer in Crossfield in, 19, in 2019. His research interest includes the complex system, nonlinear dynamics, the fractional calculus, modeling, entropy, control, data series analysis, biomathematics, evolutionary computing, genomics, and mechatronics. It is an honor to have you, to have such an important person here with us. Please welcome Mr. Tenredo Machado. Uh, dear Christian, thank you for your uh, kind and detailed introduction. <laughs> welcome. So I don't know, can I start or maybe Juan Pablo would say something? Can I start? Okay. Yes, you can. Yes, Professor, you, you may proceed, please. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon at uh, Colombia. Uh, here also uh, the afternoon uh, started uh, already. And uh, so my talk is about some computational methods of information analysis and clustering, some because there are many, of course. And uh, this is uh, only, let's say, a part, uh, a small part of my research. Uh, in fact, uh, it was uh, not the initial trend in my research. My PhD many years ago was in dynamics of robotics, in nonlinear dynamics of robotics and control. And then slowly I moved to other fields. And uh, I realized uh, some years ago that uh, we have nowadays um, other ways of modeling and treating uh, the reality either artificial or natural, uh, other man-made or from the real world, let's say from mother nature. 
we have not only the language of mathematics, because mathematics is often called the language of science, but we have also nowadays computers. I mean, we have computers since many years, but now they are in a degree of development where we can handle data and many other phenomena and many other descriptions. And I believe that it will uh, develop much further in the future. Uh, sometimes these are called big data, data series, artificial intelligence, whatever. So I am just presenting a small bit uh, of my research and a small bit of what I do with uh, uh, data series and data analysis. Okay. So let's see if I can change. Oh, sorry. So that's me, uh, that guy over there. And uh, that is a, a list of my topics, let's say, uh, those that fit in the slide. And uh, so the outline of my presentation, before going to data and some examples of processing data, I need some preliminary concepts. I will talk briefly on distance in data compression in clustering visualization techniques. Some theories like Shannon information theory and Kolmogorov complexity theory, and then uh, some examples. A first set of examples with uh, RNA from present day pandemia virus with uh, COVID 19. And uh, then uh, uh, I believe the outline is not correct. Sorry, uh, the second topic is about artistic things. So the outline is uh, I compiled my LaTeX wrongly, and uh, I had, uh, in fact, uh, some second example from recent waves of COVID, but then I decided not to put all the examples with genetics. So I changed to artistic things, so it's wrong there, okay? So uh, my uh, first concept is about distance. And the, the concept distance is very useful because when we model systems, when we describe something, either mathematically or computationally, we are doing in absolute terms. That is to say, imagine I want to model an animal. I have to give some description of the liver, of the brain, of the bones, of muscles, whatever. But uh, distances work in relative way, not in absolute way. I can compare uh, items, that is to say, I can compare animals or paintings or genetic codes or whatever, and it, that is much easier to do than to uh, try to describe all details of the object. And so the concept of distance is uh, very useful for this kind of uh, uh, processing, let's say. So uh, what is a distance? A distance, of course, our mind goes immediately in the direction of the Euclidean distance. But Euclidean distance is just one example of a uh, multitude of possible functions that are distances. A distance uh, obeys three axioms that are well known. A distance between object and itself is zero. Then uh, it's symmetric. I mean the classical, because there are generalized versions of this, but the classical distance is the distance between uh, X and Y is identical to the inverse to between Y and X. And there is the so-called triangle of Schwarz inequality, which is a triangle. If you have a, 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 the distance between X and Y is smaller or equal to the distance to another third point, Z. So, and uh, for this, you have many distances, not only the Euclidean. And I have a humoristic picture here about some distance. For example, arc cosine. Arc cosine, which is over there with a rabbit and a panda bear, uh, uh, is the angle between two vectors. So when the, it's not sensitive to amplitude. So when the, the vectors are uh, overlapping, the distance is zero, whatever is their length, their amplitude. But when they are in 90 degrees, the distance is maximum. So that is a possible distance. Now, the Euclidean distance is just a case, a special case of a larger function called Minkowski distance. And the three important examples are the Manhattan distance, the Euclidean distance, Chebyshev distance. What is the 
Manhattan distance and the Euclidean. You have the Euclidean the, there represented in humoristic chart between the tiger and the panda. But uh, uh, imagine you are in a city and that distance is between the, at the right, between the bird and I believe it's a tiger also. But uh, uh, imagine you are in a city and you go to one place to another and you cannot go in diagonal. You cannot pass through the buildings like Superman. So you have to go through the roads, through the streets, and you have usually to make angles, like 90 degrees angles or whatever. That is called city distance or Manhattan distance. So you have many distance. I will speak a little bit later about Jensen Shannon distance and or sometimes called uh, divergence based on Shannon information theory and also normalized compression distance from Kolmog complexity, complexity theory. Of course, those names, Shannon information theory and the Kolmogorov complexity theory, get a phrase. It seems very complicated, but uh, I am an engineer, not a mathematician, and our job is to put in simple way. So we shall do that. So let me take a little bit of uh, water in my throat. Now, second concept that we shall need for the, one of the distance is data compression. If you are from computer science or if you use computers, everybody knows what is a compression of a file. Okay, we have a large one and we want to reduce its size. And there are a few different algorithms. And of course, you can have so-called loss list and the lossy. Loss list is that uh, you can come back to recover the original file. And the lossy is that you compress, but in the middle of process, you uh, uh, cannot go back. It's, it's not reversible because some information will be lost. Now, in SQL, I will use uh, uh, compression uh, that are uh, uh, reversible, okay? Uh, it would be a long explanation and even not all uh, uh, compression schemes that are reversible are useful for what I'm going to say later, but th that would require a long explanation. So the, the, the selection of a proper uh, compressor is uh, needs some practice as we shall see, but uh, I will talk about it later. Now, uh, why is distance uh, so useful and so important? Let's give some thought about a simple example. I believe you are seeing a map of Europe and you have some uh, capital cities, some main cities, let's say Lisbon, which is in coordinates P1, Rome, that is in coordinate P4, London, which is in coordinate P2, and let's say Moscow, which is in coordinate P3. And the usual way is that uh, we know the coordinates and we are asked for calculating the distances, which if it is the uh, Euclidean distance is the one represented in red by the red straight lines. Now, before continuing, just to say that I'm supposing just to simplify that the globe is planar, so it's not a sphere. So we are not calculating in spherical coordinates or in the surface of the Earth. Of course, we can do that, but this is just for being simple. And second one is that for those distances over there, I am supposing that I can go in straight line, which in practice, it's not possible, of course. And also another simplification is that I can, for example, calculate based on the horizontal coordinate and vertical coordinates, so let's say X and Y, and not consider the altitude, let's say a Z coordinate. So let's suppose it's simply possible that comes to our mind. So this is the direct problem. We know the coordinates and we want to calculate the distances. And this is the usual way, the standard or classical way of comparing things. But imagine you want the inverse problem, probably you are not aware, but in many things, in uh, computational sciences, in mathematics, in physics, you have always the direct problem and the inverse problem. For example, in optimization, you get it many times. So but that is not the topic of my talk. And uh, 
So the inverse problem is imagine that you know the distances, which are in red, and that you want to calculate the coordinates of cities, which you, in this case, you don't know. So it seems the same, but is much more complicated. And uh, as we shall see, by the way, and in fact, you can calculate the distances. The original data now is distance in many ways, because I can compare, in fact, the latitude and longitude or the horizontal coordinate and vertical coordinate, let's say, if it is in two dimensions, but instead of geographical information, imagine that I want to compare citizens. And if I compare citizens, maybe I can compare the salary or the lifetime or how many liters of wine each citizen drinks per year or the, let's say, the professional activity or a multitude of things. And I can consider all of them, many of them, on only just a couple. So I have many ways of comparing things, okay? And of course, I have many distances, as I told you before. So there is a large number of combinations between what data do I compare in case I have it, and how do I compare it, okay? And uh, then how do I represent it, okay? Now, uh, for this, so the problems and the topics to consider, how many dimensions to calculate the distance? Because I, in this simple example, I was considering latitude and longitude. And how do I represent the objects? How do I visualize? There are more than one graphical ways, graphical representations, as we shall see. And maybe some are better, maybe some are worse. So let's see. And for the problems, if I am tackling data, what is the accuracy of the data? Are they real, reliable or not? For example, uh, or missing data. Imagine, for example, I did some works on the global warming with not data from NASA. And uh, NASA has a database of information for all around the world. And the maximum length of the time series is about 110 years, 110, 120 years. But in the middle of that process, the technology had advances. So the quality of the data, that is to say the precision of the data in one century and something ago and present is not the same. And of course, there were some wars. So if you go to data from Paris, for example, a big city, and Second World War, a few months, there is no data because there was war going on between France and Germany. So you don't have data. There is missing data, okay? So you can have problems of different nature. And so you cannot go immediately to tackle the data. You have to be careful. So there are many things about that. But there is also other strange or unexpected problems. For example, volume of data. In some cases, the data seems a lot, but it is insufficient. For example, if you go to the global warming, 110 years seem a lot of data. Of course, for our lifetime is a lot, but the, the evolution of the global warming in the Earth, 110 years is just a microsecond in electronics. 110 years is extremely short period of time. We needed 10,000 years or, or so. So it's insufficient sometimes. But you can have the other way around. Imagine I did some work, not published by the way, with some colleagues from education about the characterization about students, uh, about uh, their skills and what they want and this and that. And then people from education start making questions. One, two, 100, 200. So uh, I was comparing students not based on uh, six or seven or 10 characteristics, but in about 200 characteristics or so. So you can have even the inverse, that is to say, not just a few characteristics, but a lot of characteristics. So you can have many problems that are not straightforward to deal with. Now, 
I will talk mainly on two, two techniques. First of all, I must emphasize that there are many techniques, okay? Even myself, I apply sometimes others, but I like these two very much. So uh, I have used in a lot of applications. And so I am just restricting to two, let's say, techniques. But uh, you should have in mind that uh, nowadays are emerging always new and new techniques, okay? So the one is multidimensional scaling. The acronym for that is MDS multidimensional scaling. And the idea is that if you have some data set with objects, with items, we compare with a given distance, all objects versus all objects. So we construct a matrix of distances between all of them. Of course, if you use a classical distance, this matrix is symmetric because the distance between Mary and John is the same as between John and Mary, okay? It's symmetric. But you can generalize this to asymmetric distance, by the way. Oh, what is that? That is, seems very strange. Imagine you are, are in a mountain and uh, you are either going up or going down and you have gravity. So going up is apparently more complicated, more, uh, energy requiring than going down. So it's asymmetric, let's say, the distance for a, going to the peak or from the peak going down. So that is an asymmetric concept and you can use, okay? I will not go to that because it's more advanced. I used also, but it's more tricky. So let's go to the classical and the classic is symmetric distance, okay? So once you measure the data, you have the data set, you compare and calculate the distance of every object against every object. And now, based on that, uh, on that matrix with information of comparison, you try to make a plot that replicates that, those distances. And the objects are represented by points. Uh, other representations, as we shall see, don't represent the objects by points. But in this technique, which is somewhat more abstract, uh, an object can be a country, can be a genetic code, can be a citizen, is a point in some map. And that map can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Uh, of course, there are some tricks to represent with four dimensions, okay? But they are not so simple. So I will stick to, in general, to three dimensions. Usually three dimensions is better than two because you have more degrees of freedom, more possibilities to represent more accurately the information, okay? But there is a drawback because you need to rotate. Any chart in three dimensions, you in the screen of a computer, you lack perspective. So you need to rotate, okay? And to shift and to zoom to have a good perspective. So what MDS tries is based on the metrics of information of distances, to replicate in a map with two or three dimensions. Note that the original data could have, let's say, 10, have 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions. So sometimes people call it a dimension reduction or multidimensional scaling because you are passing from 10 or 20 dimensions to three dimensions. So people also say that this method is an intelligent way of reducing the dimension, okay? So there are some, uh, some techniques to do that. Uh, another way is, is the so-called hierarchical clustering, HC. Another way, uh, this representation starts again with same metrics. We compare everything against everything with some given distance. But uh, the representation, the graphical representation is not by means of points. It's somewhat abstract, needs more practice to understand that. So they represent by kind, some kind of tree, okay? Now, there are two main types of trees. There is no special name. One is dendrogram, which is a kind of tree without perspective, as we say, shall say. It's somehow like the pictures in old Egypt without perspective, okay? So it's, a, let's say, 
first uh, class, or not first class, I would say primary way of representation, not very rich, somewhat limited, but it's simple to, to understand. And then that we have trees. For people, engineers like uh, that use usually MATLAB, MATLAB represents you dendrograms, but does not have software at present date for trees. In my life, in my work, I use dendrograms and trees from uh, programs from genetics, okay? And even the dendrograms in those programs are much more efficient than the dendrograms from MATLAB. So since we are engineers, we often use MATLAB, but MATLAB is not good for these kind of uh, representations. Now, in these trees, either dendrograms or trees, we have a root, it's like a tree in Mother Nature. And you have the trunk, and you have the branches, and you have the leaves. So the objects, uh, citizens, or uh, cars, or uh, genetic codes, or whatever, are the leaves in the tree, OK? And that allows us to have a much more easier interpretation. Still, we have a problem is that nowadays with present day technology and to my best knowledge, we have only trees in two dimensions, not in three dimensions. So what happens is that if the problem is simple, to see something in two dimensions is perfect. But if your problem is complicated, then two dimensions may be two low dimension and three dimensions by for example, MDS is much better. So it depends on the complexity of the original information. Uh, so I'm not sure if um, you are following me. Maybe Juan Pablo Ugarte can yes, give me yes, some yes, feedback. Yes, is nobody? Yes, professor. Yes, yes, professor. Can I continue? Nobody yeah, complaining? Yes. <laughs> OK. No. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, I will go ahead the mathematics, but uh, uh, there are many distances. And in fact, only for some applications, I use more complicated distances. But for genetic codes, often I use two. So since I will start with the genetic code, I will talk about a little bit Shannon information theory. Shannon information theory is a kind of a shell or let's say sophisticated way of handling probability. And uh, Shannon, uh, American researcher, uh, coined the concept in the middle of 20th century. If something is a lot of probabilities, uh, high probability, then it's trivial. But if something is very rare, the probability is very low, then the information is very high. And the concept information is minus log of the probability. So imagine that I'm saying you, ha, 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 ha. Then the probability of repeating a ah, is almost one. And everybody says, this guy is crazy, always saying the same thing. But now imagine that I say something random, a, ah, x, y, z, one, two, whatever. Nobody knows what I'm going to say next. That means when I say something, it has a lot of information. And you say, oh, that crazy guy now said number two, <laughs> for example. So it has to do with that. And from that, we can coin a distance. We call Janssen Shannon di divergence or Janssen Shen uh, distance, which is um, uh, often used in biology and also in some other fields that require some uh, probability. Now, for probability, we need in practice histograms. So if the data does not allow you to build histograms, you cannot use this. But this uh, theory uses probability as the main concept. Now, the second theory has also a terrifying name, so we get afraid, but it's just the name. In, very, in fact, it's very computational oriented. It's Kolmogorov complexity theory. And the main, uh, let's say, material to handle is files. Imagine you have files in a computer. And those files represent information, OK? Imagine ASCII files, just to simplify, OK? 
you, so you have a string of information, okay? Now, imagine that you want to develop a program to calculate that thing. Imagine that the string is number pi. I believe everybody knows that the digits of number pi are almost random. There's no uh, simple way of calculating one after the other. So any program is complicated. It's difficult to do, to, to calculate the consecutive digits of pi. But imagine that you have uh, a rational number, let's say one third. So everybody knows that one third is 0 0.33333 up to infinity. So the calculation of that is very simple. So for number pi, we have a very complicated, a complex program. While for one third, you have a very simple program, okay? Now, this is the base of the Kolmogorov complexity theory, but unfortunately, it's not easy to calculate or to know or to measure what is complicated and what is simple. But it's not so difficult to compare things. And the, the NCD distance is one of several distance that says the following. Let's suppose I have two files and I compress them together. That C in the formula means compressor. XA is one file and XB is the second file. Now, imagine that they are almost identical, either simple or complex. I am not measuring the complexity by themselves. I am comparing again. That's why I use a distance. If they are identical, either simple or complex, but if they are identical, the compression of two files is the same as just a single file because they are identical. But if they are very different, then the compression of the two is just almost identical to the compression of one plus the compression of the second because they are so different that they have no common information. So that formula, which is not the unique formula, measures that if they are similar or if they are very different based on compression. And if the compressor of the file uh, is adequate, somehow this measures the complexity. Because if you have a complex file with, I mean, with complex information and a file simple without complex information, when you try to compress, they are different. Okay. So roughly, without too much details, uh, with a compressor, uh, you can measure the complexity indirectly. Now, a first example is the present day virus, of coronavirus, okay? So uh, I did a presentation, a few papers, by the way, about the first and then about the second and third and so on. So, Sometimes people call it waves. So I put here a nice picture of waves. Uh, by the way, I like very much artistic things. I was, when I was young, I was almost to painting school, not for those nasty guys called engineers. <laughs> so uh, uh, I like very much painting and artistic things and music. So uh, let's suppose that we stick to the waves, okay? So I have here a nice picture for the waves and some papers, not important. So the first study uh, one year ago or so, uh, it, I, I collected the genetic information from uh, a lot of virus, not only from coronavirus, but also for uh, flu, for example, for Ebola. So a lot of virus uh, that uh, are not uh, pleasant, bugs, <laughs> let's say, but th there is some database for that with files, ASCII files, and I compare. And I compare them based on the probability theory with Shannon information theory, or completely different based on, on the complexity theory by Kolmogorov. In fact, I compare with others distances like that cosine or the Euclidean or others, but I'm just uh, showing with two distances, okay? For people that is not uh, uh, used to genetics, let me say that the genetic code, uh, either in virus or plants or mammals or human being, is based on amino acids 
And uh, those amino acids are usually classified in four types. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and timine represent by ACTG, uh, uh, sorry, ACGT. And there is some rules for that called bond pairing and so forth. But this, again, this is not the topic of our talk. And um, uh, of course, present day knowledge, scientific knowledge, we know the genetic virus, but we don't know how to map, how to translate that information to vaccines or to, let's say, even more complicated. Uh, if this genetic code is this, then the animal will have that characteristics. Okay, we don't know. Still very far from that knowledge. Well, what I got is 143 types of virus. In them, between them, some are the coronavirus at that time, and I compare by means of the two distances and by means of the two clustering techniques. That is to say. Uh, IRECL clustering and multidimensional scaling. Okay, so uh, that is the list of uh, possible virus I did at that time: dengue, chikungunya, influenza, uh, Ebola, Lassa, all pleasant guys, as we know. Okay, so I'm joking, of course. Now the zoom takes some time to show properly this uh, plot i hope you are seeing okay now because it takes some kilobytes for zoom to process so before showing properly but at the left you have the dendrogram so a tree but the branches of the trees are in horizontal and while at the right you have a tree in two dimensions properly so using all uh, capabilities of a two-dimensional representation. And the leaves, which are those dots at the end of the branches, are the objects. The different colors means the different classes of virus and the numbers they were for a table uh, uh, correspond to each one of the virus. Well, uh, they are only colors and numbers because if you tie, that is a practical problem in this representation. If you try to put their names over there, then the labels of the names overcrowd the, the picture and you don't see anything. So usually when you have a lot of uh, objects, you only need and you only are able to put some label because otherwise you the, the names, the labels will uh, hide all the rest of the representation, okay? So the, 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 the tree in the right shows a little bit better the clusters. The interpretation of this information is based on the clusters, not on the absolute position, not, but instead in the relative position. Let me give you an example uh, how the interpretation of these representations uh, is required. Imagine that you are, uh, walking through your city. All cities all around the world, United States, Europe, Colombia, whatever, China, have always the rich people and the not so rich people. Okay? And maybe some zone where you have the mafia uh, or whatever, like in New York, okay? And uh, so forth. So you are walking and uh, there is some. Uh, uh, you are walking, let's say, starting with some rich people, and you see nice houses, nice cars, and they are all around together. Now, if you walk a little bit more, then you go to the mafia, and you still see nice houses and uh, nice cars, but maybe the people is uh, a, a kind of aspect of behavior more not so nice, okay? Even some gunshots or whatever in the middle. So. Then you move to another part where you have a lot, uh, lots of houses, maybe not so nice cars, not so nice houses, but more nicer people, not so self-convinced or not so mafios. So, uh, and usually in the cities, for example, uh, you have clusters. That is, uh, you don't have a very rich guy in the middle in the poor people or a poor people in the middle of the rich or vice versa, or, or the mafia in the middle of the, uh, uh, imagine you have some part of, of, of the, the city where police, so where 
for guys from police and uh, uh, judges and lives. Then you don't see a guy from mafia in the middle, living in the middle of the of the police. So the idea is to see clusters, to see groups of objects, and if they are somewhat together, even if we don't understand, that means that they should have some kind of similarity. They have some kind of characteristics that, that put them together. So it's up to us to understand why they are together. That is to say, the plot does not show, does not say why they are similar. That was based on distance. It's up to us to interpret the chart, okay? And objects or groups or clusters that are very distant, very far away, they uh, must be interpreted in the way that they are very different. Again, we don't know what is the good and what is the bad. So there is no good direction or bad direction a priori, that is to say. It's only after our interpretation that we know what is the good and what is the bad, if this, that concept makes sense. Maybe in the, some application, there is no good or bad. Understood? Can I continue? Now, this is for virus with MDS. Again, Zoom will take some time to, uh, now you can see okay. And uh, uh, you have here in the left with the uh, Kolmogorov theory and in the right with uh, uh, Shannon entropy and uh, or Shannon, Shannon distance, so Shannon information. And uh, we connected by a line the coronavirus, the blue line with coronavirus. And the numbers is again each virus. And you see a much clearer picture of the left with the, the, the Kolmogorov entropy, then uh, Kolmogorov distance, then at the right with Shannon distance. And uh, that does not mean that at the one side is uh, some error or vice versa, the right side. No, everything is correct, both from the mathematical point of view and from the computational point of view. What does this mean is that for this given application, one distance, one fury is more adapted to show what we want than the other. So usually people applies 10 distance, 20 distance, five distance, depends on the application with different uh, types of treatment of data and then chooses one or two depth that adapt better to the application. You understand? So there is no guarantee in advance what distance or distances, plural, will be better or worse. We need to do by trial and error. And sometimes we get surprises. And we can have more than one distance that is good for that given application. No distance is good for that application or only one. You can have all situations and depends a lot of, uh, from about the type of data that you are, okay? Now, before going to artistic things, I will stop this and show you a movie, okay? And this movie, is about, and uh, I was seeing the chat, okay? And uh, 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 this movie it will pass very fast. So uh, I will repeat it one or two times further. This is with multidimensional scaling, I believe you are seeing now, and it is with a, a a program that uh, now is no more underdeveloped, Gigobuy. Uh, it works perfectly in Linux, Linux. And uh, I hear uh, for a Mac Apple operating system, uh, the, does not work no more. So I am emulating it. Okay, so this is an emulation. So I did a movie. And uh, uh, what I'm comparing is the chromosomes from many species, okay? Uh, from human being, from a lot of ma mammals like horse, dog, uh, cat, uh, whatever. A lot of uh, primates like chimpanzee, bonobo, orangutan, and so on. Then a lot of fishes, 
birds like chicken or whatever, and even plants, okay? So the bananas and so forth. So it's about 800 chromosomes. So you see <laughs> a lot of information. And it's about almost three gigabytes uh, of information to be processed. Uh, the overall, uh, overall information is about 300 gigabytes in ASCA files with T9, GUI9, SIGDESIGN, and the other nine. And uh, so this program starts, I mean, the programming I did to put each dot and type of color and mark represents a given species. So let's say if it is a red circle, it's human being. If it is a white square, it's chimpanzee and so on. Let's say this way. So I'm not putting the labels just for you to understand, okay? Uh, without labels, but you can put. So only the marks. And the program starts to put all the marks of the 800 chromosomes in a sphere. That's why you see in the middle of this movie, I have not yet started it, a sphere. That means that it's random. All the angles, all the radius are random. So we are not biasing the information. What MDS will try, this is for multidimensional scaling, it will, do, will show you in real time the calculation. So MATLAB does not do this, just presents you the final result. But this problem is very funny because you see like a movie in real time, the calculation, the iteration of the computer one after the other. So they will give you clusters of the mammals, of the birds, of the insects, of the, of the fishes, of the plants, and so on. At the final, it will converge to the grouping, to the clustering of the marks, to the groups that we already know from biology. But you have to pay attention. That's why I'll repeat twice, because since the information is very large, it will be very slow at the beginning, but then very fast at the end. Okay, at the end, the program will not be able to optimize no further. So you will see the dots and the plots shaking slightly like a, with a noise. And I have to stop the, 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 the simulation, the, not simulation, the optimization, the calculation, because no further processing uh, will improve the map. So it's the maximum that we can get. But set start and I will repeat it later. So it will be slow at the beginning and then uh, uh, very fast at the end. So the chart in the left is what the computer is trying to optimize. Then I will put a bigger picture, but unfortunately there is no programming for that. So I have to do manually. Then I will increase the, uh, the now I order it to rotate automatically. MATLAB does not do it. Now you see a kind of pattern and you see very clearly the green dots or the red dots are close together. In fact, that uh, dense collection of points is the mammals because I did a lot of mammals. Uh, while I only did a few insects, a few uh, uh, fishes, a few birds. So the brown or whatever, outside and light blue are for other species. But I did a lot of mammals, cats, dogs, horses, cows, uh, orangutan, chimpanzee, bonobo, human being, and so on and so on and so on. So that's why you have a lot of dots in the center. I will repeat again, but it was successfully uh, applied the method and you get clusters and they make sense. Of course, the program does not say what is a mammal. That is up to you to understand. Now, this program, as I said, is very funny because you see uh, the process, the iterations. And you can have also comments to automatically rotate without the necessary to do yourself. MATLAB does not allow that directly, by the way. But uh, now the type of the clusters, that is the shape, is not important. What is important? That is in general, there are some special cases, but in general, what is important is the clustering, okay? Now, I will stop this movie 
And I will go to a very fast final example of artistic. And uh, uh, I decided to use the artistic uh, um, case because, as I told you initially, I like a lot of artistic things. So I did a few papers with music and paintings and so forth. And so this initial slide is by Escher, Mauritius Escher, which is a, a Dutch artist from, uh, let's say, the first half of the 20th century and has very nice uh, uh, drawings. In fact, there, there is a mathematics for this later on, but it's not the topic of this talk. And of course, if you notice, you have some patterns over there, okay? So this was the impossible world is the title of the painting. Uh, and um, I, I used this in another talk in the fractional calculus in Jordan. Um, Kingdom some type of some time ago before the pandemic we could travel and uh, because my talk was about impossible things okay it was inspired in the title by Tom Cruise uh, movies impossible mission <laughs> and so I had a few things impossible of this and impossible of that okay so this is not of course our talk in fact it was very funny. Because one guy, Arab guy, came to me and said that Koran had a lot of things with impossible in the text. I was astonished because I was not aware, but that is an interesting story, but it's not our topic. So a couple, just say a couple of papers. And so what I did, I compared with clustering techniques, the paintings starting by the 13, 1,300, let's say, up to present day. Uh, I started uh, in the, let's say, beginning of the 14th century because before the paintings were not uh, signed. The first signed uh, paintings were by monks in monasteries. And you see one in the uh, left bottom, uh, which is by Bondone, which is a monk. Then you see a painting in the, in the middle by Rembrandt, then Delacroix, and then a present day by Pollock, very famous with abstract art. So during this uh, not many years, I studied 100 painters, could be more, but I got 100. And then uh, between 10 and 38 paintings for each, uh, uh, for each one, for each uh, painter. And uh, so it gets 1,000 and about 300 paintings that were compared. And during this lifetime, all these centuries of the human civilization, of course, the stylistic nature of the paintings is different. And I convert to color files, uh, and I handled with, in this case, with MATLAB. And I have here, it was in a conference in fractional calculus, so memory is a, 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 a a key property of fractional calculus, I, I used uh, the, the Salvador Dali <laughs> painting, the persistency of memory, which is on the left, as an example. And I can do statistics. For example, in the right, we have the histogram of the gray coded information about the painting. Okay. So I did with gray coded and colored with RGB. I converted all paintings to a matrix, either in color or in gray. But I didn't, and I tried uh, one dimensional histogram, two dimensional histograms, so a lot of combinations, okay? And this is all uh, centuries along, and the dots means a lot of paintings. I don't know if they are clear, visible, and this is a kind of average, moving average with box plots and so forth. And we see a lot of noise because uh, uh, whatever, many different painters and have different styles. So you get not a, a kind of uniform, although there is some periods which are clearly seen by the straight lines, but I will not go to that. And this is a possible classification of the styles of paintings, but there is a lot of, uh, let's say, discussion, even in people from art, uh, where, which, how many, how many movements, they call it movements, how many types of periods 
in the artistic style is, exists and so forth. So sometimes people say much more or much less. So, uh, but uh, you have Rococo, for example, or Romanticism, or even what is called contemporary art. But contemporary art is a lot of things. So uh, sometimes Gothic and medieval is okay. Nobody discusses or Baroque or Rococo, but then to mainly on present days, there are many styles, okay? And this is a representation with clustering with that program from genetics, okay? And uh, the leaves are the painting, the painters. So, uh, and uh, this is based on information based on entropy. So Shannon information theory and the colors that were added superimposed are the time. So the blue is the beginning of the 14th century, while the yellow is the 21st century or the end of the 20th century. And we could see that there was not a clear pattern of the time in the painting. So you see blue and white, yellow and green somewhat mixed. So we could conclude that this was not sufficient, let's say, to detect. And uh, I just finished, I promise uh, about half an hour. So uh, I, I'm trying to, well, uh, let's say, to follow the rules of 30 minutes. So that guy over there smiling is me, and you have my address, and I have here some pictures of Porto. Uh, in the left, that, uh, uh, let's say, not yellow, that beige-like construction, artistic, romantic structure is very common. Young ladies to go to take pictures because models take pictures of them. There are also some stairs over there. So young couples just married from all Europe and the models go to take pictures. So when some colleagues uh, go, I mean, uh, from university, go to Porto with their, uh, daughters and wife, all the young ladies or not so young ladies like to take pictures there, okay? <laughs> I already know. And uh, at the green is a palace. It was built over a previous uh, palace called Crystal Palace, but uh, Porto is near Atlantic Ocean. And it was in all the days at the beginning of 20th century. And uh, it was corrosion in the metal. So it was destroyed by the salt of the air seed. So in the middle of 20th century, it was replaced by that building, grid one, which is also very artistic. So in the bottom, you have uh, uh, one of the many bridges over the main river in Porto. And uh, these some were built by Eiffel. This one by, was by a student of Eiffel, but you have another one. It's not visible in the photo by Eiffel. And uh, the right, uh, uh, bottom picture is about the Atlantic Ocean. We have quite a very interesting things over there. It could give beautiful pictures, but I, we don't have the time, of course. And finally, nothing more, I guess. This is the final slide. So I try to be fast. Of course, many things could be said, but I hope you enjoyed and you didn't want to sleep, okay? <laughs> Thank you for your attention, and I will be glad to uh, reply to any questions that you may have. Okay, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tenrega, for all your knowledge. This is invaluable for all the students and for us. Um, here, if uh, maybe Juan is going to say something related to this. Um, yes, thank you very much, Professor. That was a very nice presentation. Christian, uh, let uh, read first some questions and commentaries uh, from our audience, please. Okay, yes. Um, one of our students um, is asking, what are the advantages or disadvantages of the MDS and HS methods over K-means algorithm? Uh, well, K-means K is a more well-known method, and as I was telling, uh, there are um, 
many algorithms, I mean, many, a few, <laughs> not a few dozens, but a few algorithms for processing data. And I compared a few, and I decided that these two were the, those that I like it most, okay? For example, we are writing a paper where I compare quite a few more, okay, for a given application. I like these two, the HC and the MDS, because the input information is the same, is that matrix. So I can do for, for all methods and then to decide. So I don't need to program or to do different infor input information. Is that matrix, I can go to one, go to the other, to do all types of plots with the several distances, and then to decide. If I use others, uh, and I did, sometimes the results were not so good and or required different programming. And uh, so uh, sometimes the time it takes to do this or to do that is also important thing in our life because we have to teach, we have to do this. So <laughs> we try to optimize, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Um, there is another student called Catalina Tuon, uh, who thanks Dr. Tenredo, uh, and she says, I want to give you a kind regards. It's a pleasure to have you as a speaker. The presentation was very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, and she had to go because she had a meeting, but she wanted to leave like those readings and okay. farewells. Okay, thank you. Is there another student who has a question? Algún otro estudiante que tenga alguna pregunta que quiera dejar en el chat o compartir con micrófono con el profesor? Yes, excuse me, I have a question. Um, yes. um, uh, let me share my my face. Uh, give me a second. Okay. Um, I'm Alejandro Gomez. I'm a student of uh, Juan Pablo and Catalina. Um, and uh, I'm a little bit related um, um, with these um, topics. And I would like to know in, in problems with the uh, height dimensions, uh, what is a common approach you use to reduce the, the dimensions so you can uh, visualize the, the data? Yeah, I, I use these to allow this, although I prefer multidimensional scaling, a little bit more abstract, but more powerful because you can have representations up to three dimensions, okay? In fact, with some tricks, we can use up to four dimensions, but that is a little bit more tricky, it depends. Uh, in fact, we have a lot in scientific research, we have a lot of situations, we have in, input information that has 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions and uh, uh, graphical maps, graphical representations without any trick, just up to three dimensions. So we have a problem of, uh, of going from, let's say, 10 to three, okay? And uh, many people use this, for example, um, what is called, I forget the name. Uh, I was in the middle of my tongue, sorry. <laughs> in the point of my tongue, it was, but there are a few, uh, uh, classical ways uh, of doing that. I, I give uh, a few comparisons uh, all along my work on this and on that. And uh, as I said before, those I find preferable are these two, okay? But uh, I prefer between the two, I prefer uh, MDS because it is, uh, there is no restrictions. There is no a priori impositions from myself in the way I do the projection from 10 dimensions to three dimensions. Oh, it was PCA. So people, I recall the name, PCA, Principal Component Analysis. Is, a lot of people use PCA, for example. But in all, all cases, I compared with PCA, all of them, PCA was much, much worse than MDS, for example. It was so bad in comparison with MDS, I even didn't put in my papers. <laughs> it was so bad, it was <laughs> unfair comparison. Do you understand? And uh, so the, 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 there are others that uh, are almost identical to MDS, 
and uh, in the data that I tested. And uh, so we, we, in fact, we are doing some paper with comparison of a few, okay? The maps are not identical, but the quality of the clustering, let's say, is roughly the same. So uh, we can use others, okay? Uh, but not PCA, for example. Uh, and uh, I mean, we can use, but it's not good. Now, the, I like very much multidimensional scaling because the original concept is very simple. You compare things, so you don't have pre-assumptions. Do you understand? I, 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 in my research, I like to start with an empty desk, let's say, without restriction. And the less uh, restrictions I pose, the more, uh, let's say, uh, democratic <laughs> will be the comparison, okay? And uh, of course, you can put some restrictions also in MDS. For example, imagine you are comparing some item that has characteristic A, B, C, and you can put more weight, more importance to characteristic A and less importance to characteristic B. So you can give weights to the different characteristics. But I rarely did that. Uh, usually I like to compare as they are and I only test 10, 10 distance, 10, 10 or 15 or six different types of distance. And then I choose the best. Furthermore, you can compare in some methods you can do, cannot do that, both quantitative and qualitative information. So if you compare qualitative information instead of quantitative, usually that is sometimes called categorical information uh, instead of the numerical information, then you can uh, use, for example, the type of aiming distance. Either it is identical or different, and it works very well. But of course, the main question by you was the reduction from 10 dimensions to three or to two. Now, I didn't talk, but there is some diagrams to test in multidimensional scaling, for example, if the reduction of the, of the dimension was uh, successful or not. It is called Shepard diagram and the stress diagram. Shepard diagram is a diagram that uh, compares the original distances those that I measure that I want to represent with those that finally I got in the final representation. And if the original and the reproduced distances are almost identical, they give a plot in 45 degrees, a straight line with 40. That means one is equal to the other. Now, if they don't uh, represent like that, if they are blurred, it means that they are very different. And then it means that the reduction was not successful. Uh, so the stress dimension, stress uh, plot is, or sometimes like in OK, they call it stick plot. We wonder, why well, they call it stick <laughs> because it's from OK. It's a, a kind of shape like a, a stick in OK. And it, uh, the concept is stress. Stress is a kind of a minimum square, uh, minimum square optimization because the stress is the square of the distance between what you have and what you want for all points, for all objects. So if the sum of the stress is stress, again, I repeat, is the square of the, of the difference between what you want and what you get. And the, 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 the stress plot plots with, what is stress for one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, four, five, so it does not stop in three. Uh, you can go up to 10, 20, and so forth. And uh, it, it is monotonic decreasing because usually the more dimensions you plot, the less uh, error you get, the more precise is the map. Although in practical terms, you have a, a, a limitation to three dimensions, of course. But uh, uh, usually it's monotonic. And most cases, I would say most, most, most cases with three dimensions, Really, the reduction of the stress is so high that what remains is very small. And in engineering, practical applications, you can neglect the remaining. Okay. But uh, those two types of tests, stress test and Shepard test, uh, allow you to see if the reduction from many dimensions to three or to two is sufficient or not. 
So you don't have to believe, you can measure that. Thank you very much. Okay. And of course, the reduction uh, can be good for one distance and not so good for another distance. So it's not identical for all distances. So when you compare, let's say, five or six or 10 or 12 distances, you can have, you should see not only the clusters, if they are, if they make sense, if you have clusters or not, but also if the reduction of dimension is, uh, let's say, pleasant or not. Do you understand? So you have to do all those tests. Of course, in papers, due to space limitations, you don't put everything. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a very long paper. But it is supposed that we do that before publishing, okay? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Alejandro Gomez, for your question. Um, we have another student, who is Jose Manuel Arias. Uh, actually, he has two questions. Uh, he wants to clarify, uh, in the first place, what does the first level in the tree classification represent? That's his first, his first question. Well, I, I, yeah, yeah. I did explain the, the hierarchical clustering technique. There are two. In HC, there are two ways. One is to uh, start with everything and then to compare and to start to divide in two, then maybe in three or four or five. It's called divisive technique. And other is inverse. You start everything separated and you compare everything and you start to join. It's called agglomerative technique. At the end, they reasonably give the same thing. <laughs> so there is no advantage or advantage in the divisive technique or agglomerative technique. Now, when you have a tree, you have a root and then the branches, okay? Now, the root means the less specialized, uh, the most, uh, if you, I don't know if you know the word, eclectic, the most, uh, let's say, democratic. <laughs> I, I would say, oh, all human beings, I, like a saint, uh, all human beings, beings are equal, <laughs> okay? And the other say, I say, no, 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 they're the rich, the Matthews, the black, the white, the Chinese, <laughs> so very non-democratic, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so, uh, um, if you have a tree, oh, uh, well, I apologize by some examples. Usually with my students, I make uh, even Juan Pablo Ugart knows me with very, how can I say, imaginative <laughs> ways of saying the thing. They don't represent nothing with the exception of trying to clarify the concept, okay? Don't mean anything in a special case. Now, sometimes I was with my PhD students with bombs and attacks and terrorists and people was passing in the corridor and worry, hearing us about dead people and killing and whatever. So it was just an example, okay? We didn't go with some gun or knife to the middle of street killing anyone, okay? So uh, the, the root uh, uh, means where almost uh, is, we have such a, can, uh, can I say, such a, uh, huge way of, of uh, putting all in the same that we don't make any distinction. It's very democratic, let's say. And the other, the other opposite way, in the leaves of the trees, we are very narrow-minded. No, no, only this, only with mustache, and only without hair. And so, do you understand? So, it's very specialized. So, we can stop. We are not obliged to go to stop in the leaves. In the clustering with trees, we can stop in the middle. Let's say, okay, without mustache and uh, without hair is one group. We don't need to separate up to the end, okay? I didn't explain that because of time limitations, okay? But you can, let's say, cut the tree in any position, okay? It's like if you have a, a tree in the nature and you cut <laughs> part of the branches. Do you understand? You can stop there if you want. So depends on, the, uh, on what level of specialization of detail you want to reach, okay? Understood? I don't know if I could explain clearly. Sometimes in the representations, we put a fine line or a dashed line, say, we, I cut it here. From up to more specialized, I don't want to go. You understand? So 
uh, we, we are the masters of where we cut. Often we go up to the limit, but sometimes we cut in the middle, okay? Okay, thank you so much. That was so the first question of the student. And in the second, he's questioning about what is the reason, um, what is the reason why the measurement of the information is related to the probability of occurrence? Uh, uh, he means why being certain of an event doesn't represent any information. Oh, that is Shannon information theory, I guess. Well, I just explained very briefly, okay? There are some requirements for the representation of information, okay? Now, the Shannon information theory is just one. It's not the only one, okay? Uh, but the idea briefly uh, from the basic, basic, very basic is, uh, is the one I said. If something occurs a lot, it's common. No special extra relevance. But if something is very rare, can be good, can be bad, but if something is very rare, when it occurs, we have a lot of information, okay? I imagine you don't uh, have any storm in the standard days, okay? Maybe some rain, maybe some sunshine, but it's common. But now you have a hurricane or, a, or an earthquake that is rare. And when it comes, it has a lot of information, okay? I mean, I, I don't say it's good information, <laughs> can be <laughs> nasty information, but when it comes, it has some, uh, some uh, how can I say, input, <laughs> you understand? In fact, there is a, a kind of, um, how can I say, advances in the application of uh, this uh, Shannon information theory to topics like survival, or rare and extreme events. For example, uh, I am a, also a head of some um, studies about rare and extreme uh, events, which are very uncommon, let's say. And for uncommon, you have a lot of things. Asteroids in collision with Earth, pandemia, terrorist attacks, uh, crisis in finance or in economy, and uh, whatever. <laughs> so you see you words, whatever. So, and they are, they are really rare, but contrary to what the people teach is in mathematics, their probability distribution is not, is not uh, uh, Gaussian. So I, I had a student from Vodafone, from UK, from United Kingdom, that wanted to study with me because they had a blackout at Vodafone. Vodafone is a very big company, as everybody knows, from telecommunications. And they had a, a breakdown in the United Kingdom, uh, blackout, <laughs> everything. And the probability of that, it was estimated very low. And still, it was not so low because they were testing, they were supposing that it was a Gaussian distribution, a probability. And you know the tails, you know the shape of the Gaussian distribution with a bell shape with tails goes to low probability very fast. But in real world, that is not the probability distribution and many events, which is the power law or Pareto distributions, which have so-called fat tails. It's called fat tails. The technical world is fat tails. And so the probability of very rare events is very high. And what happens is that we have pandemics that we have estimated as very low probability. We have financial crises that were estimated with very low probability, but they were wrong. <laughs> they were not so, unfortunately, they were not. Of course, if we could have, what is the probability of Terrera Machado being very rich? I would love to be a, lo a lot of probability, <laughs> but it does not count. So usually those probabilities are for bad things. Okay, but that's life, I cannot do it. But um, so information theory, it's a kind of way of uh, working with probability, okay? But it's not the, uni the unique one. So in this case, but uh, you can try in the, in the literature, in the, in the internet, other ways of looking at probability. You know, uh, uh, if I ask you uh, probability, you think a number between zero and one, okay? 
Zero never occurs, one occurs all the time. That is the so-called Kolmogorov probability theory, by the way, okay? It was, uh, let's say, put in mathematical form by Kolmogorov. But that is not the only way. Uh, for example, Feynman, Richard Feynman, do you know Richard Feynman? Nobel laureate, Nobel award. And uh, Fermi, uh, also from atomic physics, they designed negative probabilities. So if I tell you, a probability of minus 0 0.5, this, this way, this Terrero Machado is completely crazy. And still, a lot of, a lot of, uh, and it is proved, it works, by the way, in atomic physics, but it's not, the, so, not so well known, and it is not the standard Kolmogorov probability theory. So all these things, there are many different ways of being uh, interpreted. So I'm not saying that uh, Shannon is the only one, okay? Even myself, I can tell you, I coined a different way of measuring information, <laughs> by the way, okay? So, but that's another story. Um, okay, if any other students got a question, because the, the round of questions in the chat are over, maybe if another student has an intervention, si algún otro estudiante tiene alguna pregunta para el doctor, Otherwise, I think that's it. Yes, uh, Christian, if you let me uh, some last final word. Uh, word. Yes. Uh, Professor, once again, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your knowledge. Uh, I hope that our attendees um, uh, enjoyed this, this talk. Um, I, 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 I'm hope, hoping that uh, everybody uh, with this information uh, will open his mind to other things because um, we are uh, uh, we are uh, you are used to some kinds of of, uh, of some manners of aborting some kind of different kinds of uh, engineering problems, but uh, after this presentation we have uh, another uh, possibility. Uh, maybe they seem strange, but they work. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I hope the, that everybody uh, will uh, retain this information and, and I hope they uh, will, will use this information for their application. So, Professor, thanks again. I don't know if perhaps or maybe um, Wendy uh, wants yes. to say something. Yes, I would like to add something. Can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay, Professor, thanks a lot for everything, for accepting our invitation. We enjoy our, uh, your thoughts and all the information that you shared with us. Uh, of course, you are always welcome to our country, to our university. And I would like to, to, to say you that, that wishes for you. Thanks, Andal, for everything. Thank you very much. OK. And uh, if there is no any questions, I am going to work, not this uh, nice life <laughs> of just speaking. <laughs> OK? So. Yeah. In case that you have any questions, you just ask John Pablo or send me an email and I will be glad to 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 answer. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Okay. Okay, of course. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Yes, okay. okay. Have a thank nice you. Day. Hey, thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thanks to all. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. -bye. Christian, muchas gracias. A ustedes muchas gracias por la invitación. Saben que siempre cuentan con el Centro de Idiomas. Cristian, muchas gracias. Wendy gracias. también. Gracias, Juan, también. Muchas gracias a todos los asistentes también.